don't. So do you want to give us a, a quick run through where, where you come from, where you are now? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm based up in Halifax, so um, not the most amazing place in the world, but <laughs> but you can't help where you're born. Um, I did uh, sort of 10 years in the military and a few bits before that, and then left the military to uh, open up, in my eyes, just a, a CrossFit gym kind of, I was a PTI in the in the military, so it was doing that usual thing of selling yourself the dream of you'll just get to train all day, which was a massive <laughs> lie. Um, and then I think we've been at that just over eight years now, uh, and we've got the two gyms. We've had another gym, which we sold off. Uh, I've got a, an event side to the company, which we put on a lot of CrossFit events around the UK, so we're probably one of the biggest providers in the UK for those. Um, and absolutely, we're going to come on to that because I think it's a fascinating expansion of what's 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 happening in that field. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then we've we've kind of delved separate diff different ways as well. Again, trying to just leverage on everything that we do. So um, I think one of the things that we'll, we'll chat about in a bit is obviously like um, a tech company side of of what we do as well. Just trying to really like like we were chatting before. Uh, a lot of these companies, you know, like gym software companies and bits like that, it started out with gym owners that go and do it. It was the same with me with the events. So we've, we've kind of done that. So, yeah, we've got kind of uh, probably four areas at the moment. So there's the the two gyms. We've got the events. Um, and then the, there's also, I suppose, our e-commerce side, mainly through the events where we sell a lot of merchandise and clothing and stuff as well. Fantastic. Now, I, probably the best place to start is the gym, because uh, obviously that's 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 where it all started. Once once you come out of the military, now yours is, yours is very different in in the sense that you've taken two concepts and put them into in, into into one club. Um, I know you run them uh, sort of separately, so you've got the CrossFit side, and then you've also got a a, a strength gym as well. So, what what made you think about uh, what one? Firstly, why CrossFit? What 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 drew you into that field? Yeah, so, I mean, I've trained pretty much most of my life. I think I went into my first gym when I was, like, 14, and you do oh, the okay. usual, you know, usual thing. Three of us, not really knowing what we're doing for God knows how many years, and then you kind of learn a bit about it. Um, when was a PTI in the military, got all my qualifications there, did a whole load more training on top of that. It was a real passion thing of mine, so I got a lot of qualifications through, through all that stuff. And then um, I think I first got my introduction to CrossFit when I was in Afghanistan, so we okay. were out there training with a couple of the, the Yanks and it was very fresh at that time. It was very new. So it was a bit like, what's this? And it was uh, the typical stereo, like stereotypical re reaction to it. You know, it was like, oh, come and do this workout, do that. And it was like handstand push-ups and some weird spinny pull-ups and all this. <laughs> and you're like, that's rubbish. Like, if I want to get stronger shoulders, I'll do this. If I want to do pull-ups, I'll do pull-ups. Usual kind of like flash reaction to it. Um and didn't really touch it again after Afghan. Like, did a few workouts, but it wasn't really my bag at that time. It, I was more just traditional. Like, I, 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 I just left selection for the Special Forces. So I was very fit, so I did a lot of running out there. I did a lot of just traditional gym work, bench, deadlift, all that type yeah. of stuff. Um, and then when we got back from Afghan, I, I ended up getting posted down to the dive school in Portsmouth. And it's a small kind of elite unit um i was a pti there and a lot of the other staff went home at weekends and i kind of the realization hit me i mean me living up in halifax and being based in portsmouth i was like i'm not really going to go home every weekend the lads all go home to their wives i was like i either find something social down here or i'm going to find a boring wife. posting yeah yeah and that <laughs> that sounded horrific so i thought let's just <laughs> let's try it's either wife or crossfit <laughs> so i uh, yeah I went and joined the local CrossFit gym and I've got to admit from somebody that had spent years and years and years and perfectly happy doing this as well. I want to admit, it's not like I was miserable training in a normal gym, but I was that typical kind of like go to pure gym, headphones on, do my training, do my sets, do whatever, go home. Completely used to that and happy doing it. But I went and obviously tried at this CrossFit gym and I was just a little bit blown away after the first week or so when you were turning up and people were just kind of like, Hi, Rick. They knew your name. They were like, how's, how's work going? How are you doing with this? How are you doing with that? And I was like, this is, it, it wasn't weird, but it was kind of nice. It was like the people actually like give a shit about you. Whereas you go to Pure Gym and most of the time you're just getting annoyed at people using. Do, do you know what? The, the amazing thing that I've always, I mean, CrossFit in itself has never been my, my style of training at that. Uh, it never has. But the, the one side of it that I think has changed the industry quite significantly is their community the one yeah. thing that they brought 
which it was there sort of. Some clubs did it really well. Others, but suddenly CrossFit came in and it was all about the community. Yes, the training was different. Yes, it was everyone just looked and go. It was a bit like Marmite, wasn't it? You're either in or you're out uh, with CrossFit. But yeah, the yeah. community, you couldn't – it was very hard to replicate out, elsewhere. They just seemed to grasp it so well. Yeah. Well, I think I think the thing is, is it's it's – it works well with the concept of it. So the concept of it is, you know, you're going in and again, this is where it changes from if you're going to run a successful CrossFit gym to whether you're going to try and be this idealistic CrossFit, um, the cult type of, <laughs> and you know, at the end of the day, what you're really doing is you're trying to get people fitter. So yeah. you need to make it scalable. So they're not hurting themselves. You need to be a good coach, make sure that you're actually managing these people properly and do stuff like that. I think CrossFit gets a bad rep because, well, there's a few reasons. I mean, you, it's changed slightly now, but up until last year, you could go and do a weekend course and be classed as not a CrossFit coach, CrossFit trainer. But let's be honest, we know enough about PT qualifications to know that they mean absolutely nothing to Joe Blogs. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, <laughs> advanced is. kettlebell ninja. What does that mean? <laughs> it's like, well, Doris can swing a kettlebell around average length but she's got it on a cv to try and sell pts so we, we know th how the industry goes but what it did mean is you could sign up and open up an affiliate and it was like hold on like i've been training since i was 14 like just my general knowledge was great then i've gone on i've done you know a, a long six month pti course of pretty much up to like uni standard of physiology yeah, and everything to do true. with that then i've gone and i've done multiple nutrition pt courses uh god no like i've got all my british weightlifting i've done all these qualifications and i did that before i even opened up a gym but you're gonna do it off a weekend course and start rattling on about paleo and zone diets and yeah all right nice one so that's where i think crossfit got a, gets a bad rep and got a bad rep i think it's definitely got better um but yeah that, that that's where it kind of gets that bad rep but if you do it properly then people are getting looked after but what they're also doing is they go in and they're chatting to people. There's chat time through the warm up. It's kind of almost like forced socializing. And I think the old days of you, like you and me probably did this. Like you'd go down the pub on a Friday and that'd be your social. Like you'd chat with the lads. You'd be like, I ain't seen you all week. Let's have a pint. Let's have a... And you'd do that. That's kind of died off in a big way, I think, recently. And I think that community side to gyms in general has filled that spot where it's like, you know what? You have your catch up now at the gym and have a good laugh. I think what CrossFit did as well is it, it, it's brought almost the studio onto the gym floor. Mm. So where, whereas a lot of clubs have this separate room that you went for studio and it, it always, studios are always good for retention uh, and did that. So you end up having these communities, but in a closed room, what CrossFit did was open it all up and go, we, it's just one unit and we're going to do the classes and the training. Everybody's on the floor together. Doesn't matter what, what experience you are. We're all doing, do, doing the same thing. Everybody's a bit like spin. Everybody's sweating their balls off, but you're all at different levels. So you're all yeah. struggling, but it's, but, it's, it's, and that created this environment. That's, and it's spread now. I mean, functional, it's more functional training than yeah, yeah. CrossFit in the name, isn't it? Um, I think, but, I think that's, that's the big thing that the class and studio stuff didn't have in my eyes. Cause I mean, I'd seen all that stuff and, yeah. you know, you did the, p90x dvds and that, like everyone did that but it was like where was the progression with that and i think the difference is with crossfit and now with functional fitness and everything is there is more of uh, an s and c kind of background to it and programming there is progression so we get people that come in that literally like have barely ever trained and do this that, and the other and obviously everyone's different so not everyone's in this bracket but for some people, it's like six months later, we're getting them to walk on their hands and we're getting them to do handstand press-ups. And I know not every, that's not everyone's bag, but to get your body and, you know, your CNS system and everything to be able to do that in like six months is pretty cool. And from a customer buying point of view, to have that level of progression instead of just going in and doing five by five for six months, like that was pretty much unheard of before this. And I do think that that is a big thing as well as the community. It creates it's, stories as well, Rick, because yeah. if, if, if you think you, you go into a no, normal gym, get on the, uh, get on the way off, oh, I squatted 110 kilograms. You go tell your mate down the pub. It doesn't really, it's, it's not, it, it's not really discussable. You go and tell your mate, oh, I've just walked um, 15 meters on my hands doing it. You've done what? 
And suddenly now you've got the, and it, it creates stories like that. And, and I think that's, that's, that's what is nice about it. It's different. Yeah. It creates stories. It creates communities and it's, and it's growing. I mean, like I said, CrossFit in the name may not be, I mean, it obviously is still big, but functional training, which really is CrossFit just with a different name uh, yeah. and, it, and it is moving in that direction. And I, and I think it's fabulous for the industry and what it's also done it's taken people who wouldn't normally do weights and heavy weights and so on, and it's made strength training exciting. Yeah. I mean, even if you to look at British weightlifting, I think British weightlifting has grown so much because of the CrossFit scene. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think there's any two ways you can argue that. Like, yeah. they're just cross, uh, like weightlifting just was not sexy. No one was it wasn't doing at it. All. It no. wasn't. But you look at all the kids now, and especially women. The amount of women now that will lift proper weights and well, go and weight train. Which God, I mean, I'm a lot old. No, I, I don't know how old you are, but I'm I'm nearly fifty. Uh, it's sad to say, and it just wasn't that. Just wasn't the thing twenty years ago. But it, but it's like everything. Like social media grows everything these days. It's been one of the curses of CrossFit coming about at a time when social media was so rife. Like, how many times have you seen someone hurt themselves in the gym, but it was just something that happened? <laughs> Whereas it's then a new sport arrives and social media's prime and someone falls off a pull-up rig now and it's like all over, CrossFit shit, look at this idiot. It's like... It, is, it is more funny seeing someone fall off a... Um, doing the the muscle ups than it is uh the, some, someone dropping i know but we, we know like, we that. know that stuff's always happened in gyms on rugby <laughs> fields every sport that's always it's just that it's come about this time of age but what it has done is it's stuff like if you watch most of the, like i mean i'm sorry but how many crossfitters do I, i'm going to sound really old and pesty now but how many female crossfitters are out there lifting big weights around wearing a little sports bra looking amazing i'm sorry but weightlifting was not doing that no, 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 not a no, chance. No, no. It's not, made not. weightlifting sexy. Uh, I, I, absolutely, it's a different clientele. Interesting point that you say because you, you said it three or four times there in terms of CrossFit as a sport. Yeah. So, because uh, that that is a big mental shift in terms of it's not training anymore. It is genuine, and we'll come on to your events in a minute. But it is a sport. I mean, we always used to have. I can't remember what they were called now. There was something before CrossFit that was was the events. I, I can remember a couple of guys at our, our gym used to do it, um, where they used to go and do the, you know, get on a treadmill, used to do a mile on the treadmill, then next, uh, and they used to compete with that. I can't, can't remember for the life of me what it's called, but it was never as big as like it is now. But it genuinely, it's a huge, whether you do CrossFit, whether you do High Rocks, whether you do your, they are world events now, which is yeah. which is great to see. But I think I think this is a like for me any sort of training has two sides to it. So there's fitness and there's sport to anything. You go in the normal gym and you know there's there's fitness. People are in there just lifting weights because they want to look decent, stood at the bar type of mentality. But there's still the sport element of that. There's bodybuilding. Everything has its extremes, and it's it's just trying to have a clear divide between the two. There's like me playing footy with the lads at five aside is an old man desperately open his knees hold out running around chasing a bag of leather right but there's a pro version to it and there's a sport version to it it's, i mean it's the same with everything and, and i'm quite clear with the two divides between the two like in the gym as far as i'm concerned we met like 90 percent of our customers we're going for overall health i want to yeah. make sure that they move safely i want to make sure they're not hurting themselves they're keeping fit strong looking after their bones looking after their like central nervous system, fitness, health, heart, lungs, the whole lot. I don't need to be getting everyone doing handstand walks over a ramp and snatching 120 kilos. It just doesn't. We don't need that. And a good coach in the CrossFit scene understands and fully gets that. And he's like, you don't need to be snatching anything. You know, you, you, yeah. you're at a certain age. What, you, what we can do for you instead is have some squats. So we still getting you nice and strong, looking after your bone density, you're going to be nice and healthy in your old age, but there's absolutely no necessity for you to be throwing weight from the floor overhead. It's understanding that, that side to it, whereas the, for me, the sport side of it and the competition side of it is completely different. And I think people that are like heading towards that need to train in a different way as well. Uh, absolutely. I, I always find it fascinating how um, sort of fitness as a sport is actually newer 
then if you take the likes of darts and you know, I mean, I, I don't necessarily call them as sportive, but I, they are. But I don't don't see them as a, a physical sport. But isn't it funny how those those are classed as sports, and yet fitness in itself, uh, I don't even know whether it's is it physically classed as a sport now. I know uh, I know a lot of these um, outdoor. Um, Outdoor events, you know, obstacle racing and obstacle stuff like racing. that still isn't classed as a sport. No. Um, and, and CrossFit isn't. Uh, and there's a, there's a key fundamental reason why. So I think, I think like uh, High Rocks probably could be because it's a set format. Um, right. I know that there are, there are some organisations out there um, that I've been in, in chats with for quite a few years and bits like that that are trying to make CrossFit into a sport. Now to make it, because then you open up grants and, and things like that. Absolutely. And what it's, gets registered as a sport now the problem with crossfit is that fundamentally from a competitive point of view you're trying to test everything so for us it, it is it really is everything and that's why like at the crossfit games there's just so many random weird stuff but we're trying to not just test who's the strongest it's who's the strongest yeah. who's the fittest who's the best at gymnastics who's the person that can adapt fastest to a new test now, the problem is, is when you're doing stuff like that, you don't have a set format. So for decathlon, they never change the tests. You <laughs> yeah, train yeah. for those 10 events and that is it. Now, the problem with CrossFit and why you'll probably never get registered as a sport is that it's constantly varied. They are constantly trying to change the events. And in a way, that's what keeps it fun. Of um, course. Yeah, you wouldn't, do want to sport, do, you wouldn't want to turn up to the same and do the same events you did for the last five years, would but, you? It wouldn't be exciting. You see, the, the way I see it is it, it, there's always a market and there's always a need for certain stuff. Now, is there a way that you can get some form of CrossFit registered as a sport because it's a set format and a set test that you do? And if there's a set demographic for that, there, there will be a market there. I don't think there's anything. I don't think you have to change CrossFit just to fit that. I think you can create a type Maybe of Maybe they need to change the definition of sport, Rick, rather than... Because if you look at it on the on the outset, it is a sport. It's it's, mm. it's competitive. It's physical. It's all the things. Just because it doesn't have a set format doesn't mean that it's not uh, you, you, you're not um, yeah. comparing the same people against against the same same activity. So it's yeah, it's it's, it's a shame because it's. It, well, I guess it doesn't really impact you guys, but it would be better to have that so you guys, like you say, have access to the grants, have access yeah. to the. Well, what, I think everything that I mean, comes with that. The, the main shame behind it is if you were to run the numbers, I think a hell of a lot more people are staying fit and healthy and keeping money off the NHS and things like that by fighting obesity, by coming and just keeping moving and doing that through CrossFit and functional fitness than there is in doing javelin and decathlon. Because I'd <laughs> like to argue that that's a pretty small demographic that are doing those types of things. Not that I want to take funding away from them, but no, no, ab ab absolutely. But it's um, you, you do need to have a look at these things and go, where's where's the where's the benefit? Now, before we move on to your um, your event stuff, you run obviously two very different gyms at, at, at your club, and and it'd be interesting for our listeners to understand what you see as the major difference or the major challenges of running one versus versus the other. Yeah, cool. So I think. Like I said, like I've said before, I've been into fitness most of my life, and a very, very small portion of that has been CrossFit. And I'm not one of these CrossFit wankers that thinks it's the be all end all. Like, if I want to get someone pull ups, I'm not going to be one of these. It's like, that. come on, Debbie, let's get a band and bounce around in this piece of shit. I'm more like, right, let's get a lap pulled down, let's get a low row, let's engage your lats, let's get you stronger, let's do a periodized set of training and actually get you that result. So for me. I, I have always loved that type, you know, the, the traditional gym as well. So we we got the op op uh, opportunity to take the unit on next door. Um, so I, I took it on. Um, but from again, from a business point of view, I was very sort of, everyone seems to just have their one type of fitness and try and cram every customer into that, into like, no, yeah. this is the best thing ever. And I'm just like, that's batshit crazy. Like, I'm sorry, but... I, I look at the market as being one of those um, shape boxes that kids have with like the round hole, the triangle <laughs> hole, the square hole. And like when you've only got one offering, you try to put every peg in the round hole, just desperately try to push it in with your ad spend and then your sales pattern and everything like that. I'm just like, why? 
like people usually kind of know what they want to do roughly. Yeah, and yeah. even if they get it wrong and you've been okay with them, they're going to go to the other one that you're offering. So I was like, that I wanted a completely different offering. So we opened up next door as a 24 seven gym, uh, hammer strength center. So again, looked at the market and everyone that was around and there's lo lots of competition. There's lots of small independent gyms. There's your pro gym. There's, there's bits and bats like that. So I was like, I'd rather just go like top end of it. I'd rather get, you know, your kind of professionals with a bit more spending money. We can charge more for it. We can have less people in. So I'm already not overly rammed like pure gym are. We've got better equipment than pure gym. And we're only going to try and attract the type of customer that want that and appreciate that. Yeah. And likewise for the PTs that work here, we're probably attracting a clientele that have disposable income that can hopefully put some money in their pocket. So we've created a better business model for our PTs as well. I can imagine it's great for your PTs because uh, from, from what I know, obviously they can they train in the CrossFit side as well. Obviously they can flick over. So the ability to really maximise your your space for the clients must be, must be fantastic for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they've effectively got the the same sort of toy set that they're getting at Pure Gym. They've got say, similar f uh, like f footprint on the floor. They've got a full gym full of uh, functional fitness stuff and all the stuff in there. And that, um, obviously there's caveats around when there's class times there. And yeah, then they've but... got a full 24 hour gym with all the hammer strength machines as well. So they can work for any client really. Absolutely fantastic opportunity, isn't it? And, and do you find that the two are, are, are different from a business perspective in terms of running them or do they, they actually complement each other really, really well? No, I think well, I think they complement each other really well. Like we've we've just done a price increase with the CrossFit gym, and we changed some of the memberships. We actually brought out a, like a compete membership that allows members to use both gyms, but only a few classes. Um, and we've we've had quite a lot take that because they want to be able to use the yeah. functionality of both gyms. Um, so that's where really well. I think the only the only difference that we really see is going back to that community side, like the. The 24 hour gym, we know, you know, on a on a chat basis, on a regular have a chat with probably 40% of the customers. Uh, and the rest of them are just headphones on, keep to the sales type of customers. Whereas with the CrossFit gym, we know 100% of them and chat with them on a daily I bet that's quite that. a weird mindset, isn't it? Because obviously it's literally a door separating the two clubs. So I, I can imagine it's really weird when you wander from one to the other and you've had this buoyant sort of atmosphere speaking chatting and walking to there and it's like oh no one wants to talk uh yeah but again i think that's just down to it's down to people and their personal choice isn't it? and I, I never i never like hold it against people it, it's right. like different types of fitness it's different types of mindsets as well and like i say you you do walk through so for sometimes you'll finish coaching a class and walk through the 24-hour gym and you'll have a right crack because the 10 or so customers that you're like walking through uh, uh, of that 40 percent that you have a good crack with yeah, yeah. so you like you'll have a really good crack with them and and that you know that you kind of just work on that but there's no kind of set and fast rule to say that that type of customers like that so we just adapt to them if they will we'll say hello and be polite and respectful if they're not really chatty people you leave them to train if they're nice and chatty you have a good laugh with them Ab absolutely so <coughs> pardon me let's move on to your uh onto the competition stuff what firstly i guess what made you go because obviously you'd have been running competitions in, in in your own club but what made you suddenly go right i'm going to actually have my own events company and we're going to make this a, a really big national activity um so i i i was competing in the uk anyway and a, a little bit in europe and then i um i was going to these events and i was just kind of I just felt like they were a bit shit. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, was, it was just one of those where you were, you were paying X amount and I was like, I get it, we're doing the workouts, but you go, there was like the standard leisure center, horrific coffee and this, that and the other. And I was like, this could just be done so much better. So my mate that I was training a lot with at, at the time and he was doing a little bit of competing, we just kind of sat down. We were in a pub having a pint and I was just sort of like, Look, do you know what? I said, I really think that we could do this better. I was like, if, let's just write down everything that we think is pretty average to crap at these events and smash it and just do it better. Whatever it takes, buy the catering contracts out, everything like that, and just do it better. And um, 
we we didn't have a clue how we were going to do it. We honestly we didn't. We were just sort of like, yeah, sod it, let's go for it. And luckily, I was I was pretty well known in the the size of the like CrossFit. Then I was I was still pretty well known. So we were just like, right, let, let's let's give it a go. Let's see what we can do. We had a few meetings with different event uh, equipment companies and bits like that. And at the time, Wolverson was nowhere near the size they are now. So we we end up chatting to. Uh, Jason and Jordan there and having a good laugh with them. And, you know, they took a punt on us. We took a punt on them and, and they kind of came on board with us. In like year one and maybe even in year two, we had to like really try and sell the kit for them as well. So it was obviously reduced. But through my network of gym owners, we pretty much sold most of the kit per event. And then the gym owners that had come and competed just took it in the cars Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's how we set out. That's how we like started out. Oh, wow. Um, So it was again just working with that equipment supplier to be like, how can we make this happen? How's this, you know, how's it work for you as well as for us? Like, we get the toys to play with, but it's got to work for you as well. So we we did that. And I mean, geez, I can remember one year stressed to hell when air runners had just come out and we ended up selling about 12 of them, you know, (laughs) like when no one could afford them. I was like, I don't even know how we're going to sell these, but we, we managed to. And I don't know how people took them home, but <laughs> but um, yeah, they're not exactly small things, are they? No, exactly. Like in the back of your car. Yeah, but but yeah, we did that, and we just we found a uh, we were going to do it at the local leisure centre, but an events company already had that, and they kind of messages and were like, "We think this is a bit out of our detail." And I was like, "Well, we, we didn't mean it like that, but okay." And off the back of it, we found a, a venue that was like ten times better. So we had this really nice, brand new venue that we'd somehow found. We had issues because it was a wooden floor. So we were like, right, we can't drop weight. So we, we ended up having to buy loads of floorboards to put down underneath the rubber matting and go through loads of hassle with that. But it's all just a learning curve. But it was like we just made sure that the event happened. Um, and the feedback was amazing. Like everything that we'd kind of li- jotted down that this is yeah. pretty crap at these UK events. It was it was kind of spit and sawdust because that's where CrossFit started from. You know, it was an industrial unit it was cold it was this that and the other and it was like that's just what it was but that seemed to have been replicated into the event scene where it was like we'll just get this big unit there'll be this on and then you just sit on a concrete yeah people won't mind if it's rough and ready people because that's that's the sort of thing and yeah and i was just sort of like nah like this is never going to get taken seriously if that's how you run it i was like i'm sorry but i'm not having it i'm pushing this you know what's strange is the clientele that you guys have because of the demographics and the amount you guys charge, you're not looking at people who live their lives rough and ready, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? It's a decent demographics because they, they need to be able to afford what you guys do. So you don't really want to give them a shitty event that they're think, paying money to attend. I think that's. I think that was the thing, though, is back when CrossFit kind of, sort of like first came out in the UK, and, and it was the same in the States, but obviously the States are a few years ahead of us. But when it first came out in, in the UK... It was that kind of like, uh, like, <laughs> like illegal club type of thing. Do you know what I mean? Flight like, clubs or yeah, but it is. It's like those are like illegal raves and that lot. They're in shit holes, but people want to go because it's like, but it's not the norm. It's like a little bit, ooh, a little bit of taboo. And that's where like CrossFit kind of got that. Like people are like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying, I'm giving this CrossFit a try, and people are like, what the hell is that? And they're like, oh, it's, it's in this little industrial unit. Do you know what I mean? It sounds crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But people are like, You're not no. CrossFit unless you lost a finger or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I can remember f- first starting out and, like, the units were... Well, there was no paint on the wall. There was, like, bits of rubber matting here, bits there. The rig had been made by Uncle Dave. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's kind of just where it started. But, again, you look at CrossFit gyms now and it's like some of them are, like, boutique as anything do you know what i mean you're like jesus christ man what was the like, build spend on this like yeah. that's quality so the whole sport has evolved but i, I well i, I can't say the events have to go with that then don't they if if, if, the, if the business is is getting there and it's attracting a different set of uh demographics and everything else the 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 events themselves and, and i guess and we won't name all the other events but because other events have grown as well it's not just been crossfit I think the whole sport has exploded. And because of those events have uh, come in at a, a certain standard, I guess you, you're having to go, actually, for us to compete as well, we we need to we, we need to, to meet that as well. Always. I, I, and, and this is a thing, like, I think back in the day, 
I'm pretty proud of the fact that I think I pushed the scene. I now think that there's other people, bigger, bigger people, bigger players that have got fantastic sponsorship deals and stuff like that that are pushing it again. And it's just sort of like you can you can sit back and whinge about it, or you can just be like, well, let's let's try and match it. Let's try and get it. Absolutely, there. but you ride the wave, don't you? I mean, if you, yeah. it's it's like anything. It starts there. That company, quite often, the first one tends to fall off, and and then it just just keeps going yeah. forward. And I mean, because ha- ha- you you were telling me earlier, you're running eleven events this year. Is that is that right? Yeah, I think it's ten or eleven this year because we've we've just bought another events company where we bought fifty percent of it. Um, so I, our goal for that this year is we've got putting two events on with it, kind of just what they would normally do because we want to see how they how they run events because obviously every every company has their own way of doing stuff so we don't want to go in and completely rejig it lose all their like volunteers and staff to then have crippled the event doing it so we want just two not years just that. they might do some things that are really good that you guys can steal and or almost bring into your fold and you don't want to ruin that before you've had a chance to see what they do yeah 100 percent. but i mean like that i'm a big believer in you know your demographic pools like we've we've bought an event brand before and one of the main things that like briefs that I gave to my team was I don't want to turn this into another battle for middle ground, which was my first brand. I was like, we, battle for middle ground was known for being pretty brutal. Like I, I don't really hold my punches, and it was heavily built off my character. So it was like, <laughs> nah. Like we we write stuff to destroy people, and we test them. That's it. And I hold no punches. With uh, that, the company that we bought was called Rep It Out, and uh, and with that one, I specifically said to the team, I was like want this to have more of a fun vibe i was like that you don't just rinse and repeat it's like there's a whole different demographic that the company that we've just bought it appealed to them and it battle for middle ground might not appeal to them because it's too brutal i was like you need to understand your demographic pools i was like so i want rep it out to be fun so that it keeps the pool that it's got and it attracts a slightly different market to the one that we're getting that wants to come and get absolutely smashed at battle for middle ground and then it's the and same you're still running this. them as separate separate um, competitions. So you've got Battle for Middle Ground, Rep It Out. Are you still running them as separate? Yeah, so Battle for Middle Ground has got four events under its brand. Um, so we've got uh, March Mayhem, which we've just had to move because of the Arnold. So that's now just called Mayhem. Um, we've got Trinity, which is at uh, Leisure Centre in Leeds. And that's more of a fun one where we use the track and field outside and the swimming oh, pool. Cool. So again, it's like different venues, different events, different bits and bats. We've got um, Ragnarok, which is down uh, near Coventry. And then Winter Soldiers is like our last one in the year, which is down there. We have Rep It Out, which is up in Sheffield. So that's like a bit more fun. And again, when we bought that, we rebranded the logo and everything and did it nice as like pink and blue. So it's got a fun look to it as well. And then the one that we just bought is uh, Castle Games. So that's up in uh, Middlesbrough. So again, now we're starting to hit a little bit further north and and hit up into that Newcastle area, and then we've got uh, Arnold Fitness Games as well. Oh wow! And 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 in terms of the sort of numbers you guys get to these events, so we, we usually like the, all the events are slightly different formats. So some are individuals, some are pairs, some are threes, fours, right up to sixes. Yeah. Um, so we usually on uh, an event weekend get anything from about a thousand to 1500 athletes and wow. then usually yeah, something the... yeah so similar spectator wise um but we have like online qualifiers to take part in that where they do workouts at their gym and they submit their scores we verify their scores because they have to video it so we can check that people aren't cheating um but like for the arnold's we get sort of north of four thousand taking part in that on the oh, online wow. one yeah i mean they look amazing events i mean i know i know i don't know whether you're still working with them but obviously you were working with bullet weren't you doing all the all the videos and stuff and they, they do look incredible events when uh when, when they take part they're busy they're exciting they they look real, real real fun i mean it's um i, I mean it's, it's just growing aren't they i mean that's that's the great thing about them yeah i think i think the, this there's from a business point of view, there's a lot of issues with them, um, which is which is why the likes of High Rocks are doing so well, which is why, like, this year we're just launching Graph Games, which is a, a much more approachable type of fitness challenge. I don't want to say like High Rocks because we don't want to rip High Rocks off, but that type of format where it's literally someone off the street can go and do it. CrossFit is 
a bit of a nightmare business wise because you can only get so many people on. Like I've just said there, if we're lucky, we'll get like 1,500 through on, on a weekend, on two days. Yet we have the same sort of size venue as High Rocks and they're getting 7,000 through. And paying, right. I think these days, paying more for High Rocks than us, or it'll be about the same. So when you look at it as you've got seven times as many people going through on a weekend. And what's the limitations? What, what, what creates that, Rick? A lot of it is on like equipment and so for instance we do it where we've got um let's take an, an individual competition for example so our pull-up rig that we that goes along will have 15 kind of bays either side so that's 30 individuals that we can have wow. on and then they've got a good kind of eight to ten meter lane that's two meters wide for them to do their workouts in each one of them needs a judge to wow, judge okay. their workout so now you volunteer sort of you know expense and the amount of people is silly high um again do you have any quality over the judges we do a lot of training for them we do a lot of we've got a, a great team of head judges and we do all this but again with high rocks for seven thousand people they've got way less volunteers than we have just for a thousand so the, the yeah. format that they have, like, a lot of the challenges running around a track, like, I'm sorry, but you don't need a judge for that. So the, the format is done very well for a business, whereas for CrossFit, it's really hard for that. Like, they're I guess the other thing as well, there's certain activities you guys do in CrossFit that you have to learn. It's like, like, like you say, you can't just turn up being a normal gym, turn, whereas I guess High Rocks, as it is at the minute, you can just be a normal gym gym go at your local ledge center and go, I'm going to train for high rocks and go and do it. Whereas CrossFit, there are certain things like, is it the muscle ups where you. So, yeah, like, like with that, we've, we've got different categories. So, what we have is, we have, again, it's CrossFit terminology. We've got uh, scaled, which is, let's say, novice. We were the first people. So, battle for middle ground, the name actually comes from before there was only scaled and RX. Right. We created an intermediate level. And I'm putting my hand up to say that because my business name is on it and nowhere else was doing it before. But again, it was to get more people through and also yeah. create a bracket where, say, at, like the top category was full. So you either never qualified for that or you went for scaled. And if you're reasonably fit, you just got belittled. You were like, yeah. this is, you know, you make me do the child's version of this. So that's why we, we introduced that. So we have scaled, which is, uh, you know, your novice. We've got an intermediate one, uh, which we call middle ground. And then you've got your RX, which is, I suppose, your pro if it was um, high rocks. And then what we've done as a business as well is we filter the top lot off that into elite. And they're the only ones that play for prize money. So, again, unlike a lot of other fitness racing events, we have, I think my podiums probably cost me anything from 60 to 80 grand a year. Bloody hell, wow. And you bear in mind that you're not being in business that like that you've got to have earned the vat on top of that as well yeah absolutely it's wow. pretty savage but it's kind of a norm within the crossfit community so it's how do you just how do you get rid of that without big flashback so again like as a business we're looking at different ways of potentially offsetting that where i'd like to reduce the podiums but rather than just keep the money like a greedy bugger is i actually want to put it into a, a pool that pays for any like crossfit athletes that are make in the uk that are making it to sort of semi-finals or games i want to try and help them with the the costs of that so yeah, be amazing. We, we could buy their flights and their accommodation and then at least we, we're claiming the vat back as a company but what we're doing now is we're really pushing the spot and pushing the uk scene so it's been great over the past sort of like four or five years now on the international scene seeing how many english well not english but british athletes yeah are actually getting to that level now and pushing it. And and that's something that I'm quite passionate about trying to help and trying to push. Um, and I, I, absolutely. If you can do that. And you'd probably find a lot of the athletes would, would almost accept that if they knew, because ultimately if they're getting onto your podiums and they're able to take it further, they're the ones going to be benefiting from any, any. So although they're not getting the cash in the pocket, they may get their free flights or they may get their accommodation. Yeah, they yeah. Get, so there's something else to compete for, isn't there? So yeah. Yeah. I think the thing, the reason morally for me is why we do those cash podiums and only for the elite is that's usually where you're getting people that are trying to be professional athletes. So they're not having a full-time job. Yeah, yeah. So podium money is their salary. Podium money and sponsorship is their salary. And trust me, in the CrossFit scene, 
it's pretty rubbish. Like yeah, it's yeah. usually. Well, it's a bit like uh, my, my brother has an MMA club and everyone watches UFC and thinks every, all these fighters get paid big money and stuff like that. You start going down to the, uh, to the normal events, still TV events, uh, and they're not paid big money. I mean, a couple of these fighters grand a fight, that sort of thing. And yeah. you think that's a massive risk to be taking for a thousand pounds. But obviously the aim is if I do those thousand pound fights, hopefully I become one of the 1% or the 0.1% yeah. and get to UFC or whatever. That's, that's the aim, isn't it? But well, this, this is it's not a big for, money. In it. No, mo most of the, like the, the, the top athletes in the UK might pick up, you know, like an energy drink or whatever. And if they're not lucky, if they get free drinks. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, great, I'll pay my mortgage with them, shall I? Or if they're lucky, they might be getting like, I don't know, 200, 250 pound a month. And it's like, sorry, but that still ain't paying a mortgage. It's not going to get me a vehicle to drive around. Like, how am I supposed to train like a pro athlete? Yeah, when, it's difficult, and, isn't it? And, yeah, and this is where making it a sport comes in because you look at a lot of, you know, like GB weightlifters before they lost that you know the the funding yeah and at least they were getting money for being a gb athlete and then the sponsorship deals in it you look at most of the the like top olympic lifters in the uk and they used to be relatively quiet on social media and were focused on training and then the funding got cut and now all of a sudden everyone's on instagram this that and the other because that's the only way they're going to pick up sponsors. Is well now. Well, it's I've the same as basketball, didn't it? All those basketballers and they lost huge, huge funding because they just like, you're not winning medals. We're taking your funding. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it sort of defeats the object. That's that's not the idea of the the sports fund. It always gets me when the huge funds go to football, and you, you know grassroots football. And, and fair enough, go to grassroots. And you're going, but that's the most. Well, it's the richest sport on the planet, probably. Mm. And like they don't need our money. What needs to happen is someone needs to say that money you guys are earning needs to filter down to yeah. the bottom. You're not getting any government funding. And then the government funding and the sports England funding and everything else then goes to other sports that, that allows it to grow, like CrossFit, like like there's loads of canoeing, all that sort of stuff. You know, what I mean there's loads of activities out there that morally are far better than football. And, <laughs> and I just actually, think it's a case of grow. like it's just like you've said, if you if you look at the sports and you look at the industries, if they're doing really well, and let's be honest, like I, I don't know any pro football clubs out there that wouldn't be able to pay 1% per month to grassroots to actually bring in the sport on and still be a wealthy club. Do you know what I mean? Like, it ain't like they're, they're knocking around with 100 quid a month and that lot. So I don't get why that's not just put in as a, like, you know what I mean, you 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 you're a big business in our country. This is not a taxation, but this is a part yeah, of... Yeah, it should always be a moral a moral tax, shouldn't it? So if you want to grow your sport, you pay for it yourself because you're worth this much money. Other, where other where do those grassroots athletes athletes end up? So the government's paying for that to get them into this sport and nurture them and get them better. And when they do get better, you're going to buy them or you'll already have them in an academy and you're going to make billions off them. But the government will pay for that. Don't you put your hand in your pocket? Scary, isn't it? it yeah, is but I think scary. they should do. And then there's more to act because again, the more sports that are out there getting this funding, especially the ones that need it and pushing it, the more people are getting into fitness. Hopefully, I'd like to think that that's then less people on the NHS. So you you kind of you you're saving. On and I think they pocket. have to realise as well, Rick, that not everyone wants to play football. I mean, I played football until I was 20, but it's not a sport I necessarily wanted my son to play because at, at grassroots, it's not a nice sport necessarily. There's a lot of aggression on the on the sidelines. The referees don't get aggression. It's not really a sport that uh, that you want to go, hey, do you know what, that's got great moral values, that sport, because it just doesn't. It's well played and it's attended and everything else, but it's not a great sport to bring your kids up through. I'd far rather my kids do CrossFit do rugby, do cricket, do canoe, all those sorts of sports that actually don't bring all the horrible bits that, that football does as well. And it's in like, well, let's grow all sports and, and let's see what other people want and, yeah. well, uh, and put some money behind it. I think it's just one of those, isn't it? Like, it's, I mean, I don't have kids, but I'd rather my kid really gets into something that's right for them. And then that's a lifelong passion that keeps them fit and healthy rather than kind of going down the route of you're doing football because that's what I did. So 
you're getting forced into it. You might not really like it, and especially not standing around on a sideline when it's freezing because you're sub and, and it's that and the other. Or, like, I love rugby, but if I have kids and they don't enjoy rugby, I'm not going to force them to do it, but I'd like there to be options for them to find what's right for them. Absolutely. Now, one question I did want to ask, because obviously CrossFit, oh, a few years ago, three, four years ago, got a bit of a hit, didn't it? And it, it got really bad press. And it, Now, did that impact you guys as a business? Did it impact you guys as a sport? Or was it pretty much a head office thing that everyone went, it shouldn't have said that, and, 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 and that would be an impact for them. But it didn't really impact the sport and the, and the competition as a whole. Um, I don't think it really did. Um, I think people are fairly fickle and forget fast. <laughs> but also, like, I'm, I'm not completely... It's one of them, isn't it? Every, everything's business and everything gets, you know, twisted, manipulated, this, that and the other. I don't know, Greg Glassman. I'm not going to say whether, what he said was which way or the other. But from the email that actually got released of what he said, I think it got massively spun. Um, it, it was well, we were right, right in the middle of wokeness, weren't we? The, the, the... The well, society had taken a drastic turn at the time. So things like society was, uh, you know, middle of lockdown. Things weren't great. Everyone was overthinking everything with too much spare time on their hands. It was right in the middle of uh, Black Lives Matter, and it was then a, a, a race thing that was getting said right in the middle of that. Um, I think it was just a crazy time, and I'm, I'm not making it exceptions for what he said or anything, but. From everything that I've kind of read into it, it was a it, it was something that he said to a lady that he knew quite well that had been spun. Now, yeah, I just wondered if it impacted because obviously you with all your competitions and everything else, it's uh, I mean it doesn't seem like it has because you guys are really busy, but it was just it was just to see whether that that impact on CrossFit as a brand. No, had, I don't think um, so. I think it, I think you guys overall as a business. I think the main difference was it changed CrossFit as a business. Like if you look at what it happened structure wise, so. Straight away, they had to put someone temporarily in. Then somebody else stepped in to do it. They have been replaced by somebody else. So if you were to actually look at it from a HQ point of view, like a lot has changed because of it. Yeah. We're yet to find out whether that's for the for the better, for the worse. Um, a lot that comes out from CrossFit at the moment is that they're trying to like really rapidly grow. Um, and I, I, from a personal level, I think they're trying to do that more in the, the Middle East. Oh, um, okay. Well, th- that's you look what the at, money is, to be fair, at the minute, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's just that it's like the demographic as well. So if you think each affiliate is pays them, uh, I think it's just gone up. So I think it's about three and a half, four thousand pound a year, which a lot of affiliates moan about. But it's it's a business spend. It just it is what it is. No, you're not getting business, real business support for it. You're paying to be able to use that word, and it's up to you yeah, to yeah. justify whether there's value in that. But if you look at like the number of affiliates that there are in, say, China compared to the population, that is a ridiculous market. And I'm sorry, but someone in CrossFit HQ would be smoking a crack pipe if they'd not said, I think we need to hit that. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, of course you're going to. It's a huge market that's barely been tapped. And if every gym that opens up is going to be paying you £4,000, there's a absolute ton of revenue there so yes i fully think they should be doing that um but yeah i I think that that's the thing that changed between it i think it went from more of a um and you'll probably see this with gyms uh like as they grow they've started out with being very um owner orientated and as they grow a team needs to go in there like i'm sure you'll see massive differences between uh, a really small gym and a corporate gym or even just you know like a, a boutique gym where it's run by a board and, and things like that like yeah, there's yeah. a massive difference in that in the way that the business is run the formalities and things like that and it I has think- to change doesn't it if, if you're growing the, the stru- it's like if you suddenly open 10 10 clubs you suddenly find your role would change and, and how you run them would would, would be different because you suddenly have to standardize everything rather than being flexible around what what you can do on that one side so it, it, yeah. it ab- absolutely will, will will change now in terms of your development uh because obviously 
you you do loads of stuff, and, and probably people probably don't even realise that uh, that you do building stuff, you do all, all, all sorts of stuff on the side. That, but where's where's Graft going uh, over over the sort of next next twelve months? I know you you're looking at acquisitions, you're looking at growing growing the competition side. So what's the what's the big developments that, that are coming forward for probably next six twelve months? Um, pretty big actually. So we we kind of at this this because we've got. A large customer base with the events with the gyms that they're doing well um hopefully stepping back from the gyms more and more to kind of oversee the the, the company as a whole for me graft which we, we're trying to push as a brand so i don't want it to be just seen as a set of gyms i don't want it to be seen as the events or just a clothing thing i want it to be a brand and yeah. the brand pretty much stands for hard work and that's hence the name like I want to be a brand that's there to support and recognize people that are willing to put the hard work in because for me in a gym environment that that's a key thing and, and in life and in business in being a parent in everything it's like if you're going to be a lazy piece of shit then you kind of don't deserve it like you've got to work at this stuff you've got to work at relationships you've got to work at being an amazing father or mother it takes hard work and i want to be a brand that stands for that and represents that so with the gyms um we we want in down the line to build that into more of a license model where we use as we grow we use the size of what we're doing to build in not only systems but teams within it so for instance like how many gyms go out to an external marketing company to help them market whereas i'd quite like to build an in-house marketing team that can work for any of our like graph gyms Absolutely, yeah. and really help them and, yeah and, and accountants bookkeepers and have everything as part of your business because i need it anyway and i'm outsourcing it so if i can get a couple of more gyms signed up it's like right well do you know what we're just sharing the cost now but what you've got is you've got an in-house bookkeeper who's going to keep on top of all that and take it off you so that's with the gyms we're trying to build that um we're trying to build like a clothing range so there's the apparel side of it so that again that just helps revenue helps i think you've got a nice design there haven't you i mean you you've obviously spent a lot of time and a lot of effort a lot of thought but the graft logo and the graft brand looks really smart so i think things like clothing and stuff like that it's an easy it's an easy in isn't it because it just looks good yeah, we got we, we get quite a lot of compliments on the brand, and it did take quite a lot of time to to get it right. We wanted yeah, some. It, it's the same. I see a lot of people, and and I think I think with branding, people have this temptation to go too much and too fancy, and this, that, and the other. And I, I'm massively on like keep it simple because it's like Marmite. If you go too one way, you're going to put off just as many people as you attract. If you keep it quite simple, then it's more down to like for a prel, it's more down to the garment and whether they like the fit the cut and things like that but it's also if you've got a nice brand it's easy to replicate on various different businesses as well yeah quite sometimes people go i know you'll get uh business mentors and everything go niche go niche but the problem is sometimes you go too niche and it doesn't give you that so you end up having to set up another business and another brand and another brand and another whereas what graft is you can pretty much go like you say across your competitions across your clubs across your apparel everything you do that brand can just fit and the and i guess all the values that go with that brand can just run across all of them as well yeah yeah i mean that it was pretty much always the the, the plan that and again there's the two different chains of thought isn't there there's if you're going to be specialist you do want to be niche you want to it's a, like with social media if, if you want to stand out, you want to just attract your type of tribe and you do want to be very kind of just, this is what I do, this is this. And over the billion people or so that are on the planet, you're going to find enough to do whatever yeah. you want to do out of life. Um, for me, I knew that we had multiple aspects to this. I knew that we already had two gyms. We had the events, we had this, that and the other. So I knew I needed a brand that I could kind of have as an umbrella brand that could go across them all. So again, that, that played a big part in selecting the, the, the brand. Fantastic. And in, ter in terms of um, challenges that, that, that you faced and you sort of go, well, okay, if you were to, if someone was to say, come on board with it, with a graph, what would you say is the biggest things that, that someone needs to, to grasp the concept of or, or, or to, to look at advice wise, three points that you sort of say, if you're opening your own gym and you want to go this way, these are probably the three key, key things you need to consider. Uh, I think for me, like the, the number one thing is, um, long-term plan i mean even when i left the military i wanted more than just a gym so I, yeah. I knew kind of where i was i had a rough idea i didn't 
I didn't have a f- firm plan of these are my steps and I will get the unit next door and things like that. But I knew that I wanted more than this. I knew that this had to be my retirement fund. You know, and you're not yeah. going to do that just having one gym down the road. So um, it's that clear vision of wh- where your end goal is. Um, I think that that's the number one. You know, everyone, if you speak to anyone with business, they're always like, what's your exit plan? And, and you've got to have that. Um, I think, I think point two would just be like, I'm trying not to swear here, but <laughs> feel free. Don't be a pussy. It's going to get rough. Like if you back down every time it gets hard, I'm sorry, but you might as well not start out right now. Like just yeah, yeah. sack it off, go get a night of five because on a monthly basis, something is going to challenge you. Um, whether it's just, you know, unexpected, useless accountant fees <laughs> for, <laughs> for stuff they've not told you that you need to pay. Um, it, it, it's just monthly. Something is going to hit you every month that makes you be like, shit, why am I bothering doing this? Yeah. Which is why I think you need a strong point one, which is your end goal. You need that to tether you. When you need to know why you're doing it, don't you? You need yeah. you need to have that uh, that thing to keep keep coming back to go. This is this it, is why I, I it's one of the through. it's one of the, probably the things that I get asked the most from people as I chat to them. They just sort of like, why do you keep on putting all this on yourself? Why are you doing that? And then I tell them I'm about to buy another company, and they're like, why? What is wrong with you? And it <laughs> it comes down to one thing: I'm fucking retiring. <laughs> it's that. It's my end goal. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing everything. I'm putting all my eggs in a row now and I'm putting myself through the mixer right now because by the end of this year, my business, if it goes to plan, should be turning over anything from 1.6 to 2 million. That's the plan for this year. And everything that I'm putting in place should grow that by at least 50% the year afterwards. Sorry, but when I've got a business that's out of size on just the small office that I'm in and that like, I can afford enough staff to not turn up to work. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's taken eight years of relentless pushing myself to do this. It's taking right now me spending every spare minute. I'm not in the office or doing bits around the gym. I go home and I renovate the house that I'm trying to either in the next six months, sell or remortgage to free up all the equity that I've got in that to buy another business that makes silly profit that's going to pay me back that however much I'm putting in, however many hundred thousand pounds, it'll pay me that back in two years. I'm sorry, but if you told me I could go and put like 250 to 300 grand in the bank and it would double in two years, I'd do it. Of course you would. Yeah, but I'm just doing it through one of my businesses. Absolutely. But you've got to get to that point. You would, I wouldn't be at this point if I had not relentlessly pushed for eight years and, put, and, and, and relent- to, to, to be f- absolutely and to be fair to you Rick, it is relentless because uh, obviously most of us who know you can see the hard hard work that goes into into your business and and and, it, and it's paying off and and one final final point Rick just just to finish off we always like to ask ask the guests what is it I've, I've probably grasped the concept of this already but I'm going to ask the question what uh, what is it that motivates you to do what you do every every day um other than retirement there's retirement, but I think I think as well. Um, for me, I got asked this a little bit back on another podcast that I did, and a, and a big part of of my whole mindset, which I cannot shift for the life of me, is I wasn't, and I still am not, the tallest person. So, for me, growing up in Halifax, which is a big rugby league town, being not huge on a rugby field you either get dominated or the biggest tip that I got in life from my rugby coaches was you hit them as hard as you possibly can and you get up like it didn't affect you. And if they get up, okay, you hit them as hard as you can again until they stop running at you because they're scared of you. And that's how you've got to be. And and that for me is my like wee man syndrome where I want to beat everyone. So a big motivator for me is I see people do this and I see people moan about the gyms that they do and events and this, that, and the other. It's why I wanted to do an events company and my first part of call is I want to do better than them. It wasn't, do you want an events company? It's they're not doing this well. I want to do it better. 
And that's why we set, started an events company. It's the same with the gyms. I see a lot of gyms not do too well. And to be perfectly honest, and this is going to sound pretty brutal, but it comes down to the owner not strapping a pair on and addressing the fact that they've got to do it better. And they can't manage the team. And it's like, well, just learn to manage your team better. What, what's gone wrong? Address it. Try and be a better manager. I continuously try and be a better manager. And I'm always asking my team, just to be honest with me, whether I've been a prick or not, which is usually <laughs> the case. But if you don't hear that stuff, how do you how do you refine it? How do you get better at the stuff that you're not good at? How do you push it? Yeah, forward? a lot of people don't like to hear though that 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 criticism, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, we, we used to do 360 degree uh, management stuff at Marriott when I was there. So once a year, the staff used to get the opportunity to give you that 360 and some of it was absolutely brutal mm. you be sat there going sat with your own manager going i can't do this anymore this is that's not fair that comment's not and you're like but what it does is once you get over that initial oh that's horrible it gives you opportunity to grow because you go actually i thought i was like this my my friend um real old school buddy used to say to me uh, perceptions are reality Mm. So someone's perception of you is their reality of you. So it doesn't matter how you see yourself. Someone's perception of you is their reality. So if they think you're a twat, <laughs> you are one. That yeah. is the, that, that, that's how it is. And so what you've got, to, if you don't know that they think that way, how can you ever change your behavior to change their, their thought process? And that's, and that's effectively what you, what you're saying there. And it's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I've lived by that in terms of, I, I'm, I'm sure the people that still think I'm a twat, but, uh, I try my best <laughs> to yeah. understand how they perceive me rather than uh, how I perceive myself. And this is it, I think, isn't it? I, like, I always try and play it off this, like, 48-hour cool-down period. Do you know what I mean? Like, go, go and sit in the sim bin for 40 hours before you say anything <laughs> to anyone about the shit that you didn't want to hear but you've heard. It's like, because you, right now you're going to go off, in like, your, your gut reaction, your feelings, your emotional state, and and that can't be trusted. Because it's like the chimp paradox, isn't it? It's like that's the chimp throwing poo in your head. You need <laughs> that, you need him to go back in his box and the computer take over and actually analyze it a bit and be like, actually, they're right. I am a narcissistic prick. I need to. <laughs> I need it's to horrible, and... though, isn't it? You sort of go, someone tells you, you go, no, 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 that's, that's not uh, actually maybe but that's how you grow and that's it and that's yeah. how i grew as a manager and i never got everything right clearly but it just allowed me to go actually in that situation i need to address it differently and i started i started seeing people as people rather than than than, than the positions they held if that made sense yeah, yeah. so you're a gym instructor i want you to do this so i was treating them because i needed them to do that certain work and then you got the feedback and go, actually, in order to get that, I need to treat them like the person they are and their personality. And that's how I get the result. And it changed massively how the business ran and the yeah. success we had and everything else. So it was one of the, like I said, it's really uncomfortable. But we used to do it with our general managers, you know, and our regional managers. You sit in meetings, at, I, don't, I don't know, go to a nice hotel for two days. And then you'd have these feedback sessions. You'd have to do it to like the cluster manager who... I don't know, it's on 150 grand a year who you were shit scared of for saying anything. You'd have to put these um post-it notes up in terms of what you thought what you thought you're like going, oh my lord, this could kick off. Um <laughs> but they, they used to do the same thing, taking on board and, and yeah. it just the whole business changed. It was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the one of the biggest things I'm I'm kind of like really working on at the moment is is uh, it's just this thing of like people make mistakes, you make mistakes. Like if they're, if they're making mistakes, the chances are it's because they've taken the job off you and you'd have made the same mistake. Yeah, yeah. So shut up, support them. Like, it's cool to make mistakes. It's the only way that... I, mean, I think we, we've just launched one of our events, um, this graphic games. It's one of the, the, the kind of functional fitness bits that we're doing. Um, and it was one of my members of staff, Josie, it was her first time building this event on the competition software. Um, and she's got it she got it slightly wrong and she was like oh no and, and, and you know she was straight away really apologetic and stuff like that and my immediate answer was like it's cool i was like i'd have probably screwed it right up you've just <laughs> screwed it up a little bit like that's better just trust me i was like but now what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to fix it and you're going to learn the system even better than if you'd have just fluked it and got it spot on the first time absolutely but, but i think a lot of managers don't do that and they, they they get annoyed at people doing stuff wrong and it's just sort of like mate you'd have done it wrong just shut up. Our, our shut industry up. needs to. I think that I won't keep you much longer, but I, I guess one of the things that our industry doesn't do well is because of the way 
I think people progress through their careers into gym ownership, and especially independents. And this is not to knock independent, but because of the way they come through, they don't always have a huge amount of management experience before they get there. Yeah. So that traditional route of going through, I don't, I don't know, say a David Lloyd or whatever, where you're receptionist, gym instructor, PT, then duty manager. They don't have that those routes. So they haven't learned all those skills. So they're almost going from PT, get their funding, open a gym. Now they're managing staff and they never actually managed people before. And they're having to learn that on the job. And, and and so they miss out all those key learnings that they should have had in there. Like you've had through the military. But you've had the, a lot of those learnings all the way through in terms of... Yeah, but, but it was so different in the military. And I, I'm, I'm learning that all the time. Like in the military, you get... Like someone's gone through all their... Like 32 weeks of basic training. Then they've probably gone through X amount of years. Like when you get someone to manage in the military, there's a massive, massive part of... Um, I don't, I don't need to teach you that. You've been taught that at this point. Whereas when you come into the like the civvy industry, you can get people that literally, you're like, why are you doing that? And and then and you start realizing, you're like, wow, in the military, the bit that I really took for granted that you didn't, it didn't resonate until now when I'm managing other people was the level that they were at that you could take for granted when you got them. And you could just take them outside and fill them in, which always helps. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it was completely different management. Whereas, and this is something that I am continuously looking for in the fitness industry is a fitness industry management structure with courses to go on. There's like CLM where you can take people on to learn management. There's, there's I've just put Matt. Uh, Matt's just about to finish a, a management course at the uh, the college, which is online, which has been useless to him in this industry. And there doesn't seem to be one. Like I don't know whether the big—I've never worked in a big club, so I don't know whether the big clubs have their own. Um, some some, do, some don't, but I tell you who is trying to do this: the 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 um, GM Active. All those guys up in that in that group in Manchester, the sort of local uh, authority groups. They they've got a group GM Active. There's I think there's twelve leisure authorities, and they're now the likes of John Oxley and Andy King and people like that have put together something for them. Yeah. And uh, because they, they were saying they don't have this management training going through. So, it, but I, hopefully, and I speak to Andy all the time, well, quite, quite regularly, and hopefully that will then transcend outside of that. Because yeah. I think they work with Future Fit for Business. So I think once they've got it all, I think it's on about their second or third course now run through. And I think once they get it to a point where they think it's right, I think you'll probably find that Future Fit for Business will probably take it on yeah. as a as a proper course. But you're right, we don't have that stuff in our industry. Yeah, it's it's not, like not as an industry, it just seems to be missed. Like I, when I left school, I went into the building industry for seven years before I went into the army. And there, there was clear, like, obviously a lot of what you did was experience on the job, but there was like this is going to be your first qualification that allows you to yeah. be a builder. And then, yeah, you're going to get time on it. But then there's another one, like right up to quantity surveyor and things like that. Like there was a clear linear path and multiple paths of where you could take that industry. Whereas with the fitness industry, it's like you're going to, you can do your PT course. Now you're a PT. At some point, if you ever want to really expand that, like there's the route of just being online PT and just being a one man band, but you want to expand it, you need to take a team on. Where the hell is like management I think stuff? There used to be the Institute of Leisure and Amenity Management, and that that got pushed under uh, Simspar, I think. So I think Simspar might, might if if you have a look on their stuff, they they may have, still have some stuff because they used to have like a, I can't remember the levels now, but it, it'd be like a junior management, management, whatever. You could work your way up to like practitioner. A lot of the leisure trust, their their senior directors and people like that tend to do the the Simspar or old ILAM courses. Right. Um, so they, they, but there's not. I think the other challenge you have, Rick, and uh, and this is um, unfortunately the way our business has gone where you used to have teams in our club, so you used to have a sales team, a reception team, a gym team. Uh, what tended to happen is you get natural progression, so you get someone from the gym team wants to be a duty manager, so you train them up and you develop them through. Now, what tends to happen is because we don't, because all our PTs as a rule tend to be freelance, people get pushed from Jimmy Strutt to the freelance PT. And so they miss all that then opportunity to do the operations in the club and everything else because they literally go freelance. I'll do my own thing. I don't need to be part of the club in essence. So we lose so many people to that side of the business now and they're not coming through this natural yeah. route where they grow and develop and get experience of running a club. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's one of the moves that we're trying to like, 
in the next 12 months or so is we're, we're trying to push towards everyone being fully employed by us so again we have, we've got quality control like it's the easy route isn't it to get self-employed it's like you're not you're not gonna be any stress to me like if you're not good that's up to you yeah we don't make money it doesn't really matter there's exactly. no it's, it's very easy and lazy uh, for us I, where i'd like to go and again trying to be i get a great reputation is i want to pay decent salaries but yeah, to yeah. a bit to attract the best and be like look it's cool this is why i want you is because you're really good at this my brand's going to look good and getting the best trainers but i want to give you the security of doing it but then i also have control and career progression for you of like do you know what you can't pt forever some point you're probably going to start falling apart i know i am so it's like well yeah, yeah. let's try and build a career path for you and i don't think i think it's been something that's i feel being a bit overlooked within the the fitness industry like i look at other industries the one that i look at a lot and uh, maybe make a bit of a weird comparison but it's like the mot industry it's like you're doing the same things like people are coming in and paying a chunk of cash to have a, an experience or like get the car serviced and then leave but i don't know many mot centers where everyone's a freelance uh you know mechanic in there just doing their own stuff it's like it's it's a business that has an ad spend that gets its reputation out and brings customers to you and in return the lads and ladies that are on the floor and it has a career path and it has admin staff to do stuff and people work to their you know their their strengths i was like but the fitness industry just doesn't seem to have that apart from some of the big clubs and I think we, it needs we don't it. have a set of standards doing it and i know mm. that's a big thing that uh, being discussed with uk active and whatever uh, but it's just really difficult because uk active they can only do so much. I mean, they get criticised a lot, but uh, they can only do so much because they're not actually our governing body. Everyone yeah. looks at them as a governing body, but they're not. They're, they're a trade body. They, they work for their members. But everybody looks at them to go, oh, you need to you need to get this from the government. You need. To, it's like, well, hold on. We're not actually, technically, we're not that body. Uh, but I know they are looking at all those things, improving the training, improving the, uh, the standards. We almost need like a um, hygiene mark like the restaurants have, don't we, to sort of go, you are, you've got all this in place, you are a five-star club. doesn't mean you're the, you've got the biggest and better kit. It just means you've reached these certain standards. So you've got all your training in place, health and safety is in place, you, tra you know, first aid, all that sort of stuff is there. And I think that will come eventually. And I think the more the industry starts talking and the more the industry gets together, but it's it's really difficult because unlike a lot of industries, we're not one thing. Like, I guess, although there's loads of different restaurants, they're pretty much the same. As a building, they're pretty much the same. Hygiene standards are easy. Whereas you look at leisure, anything from CrossFit to uh, to boutique, to cycling, to yoga, to, there's so much involved in it. How do you, how do you make one standard? And I guess they're, 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 they're the challenges. But it's uh, I know there's movements being made. Uh, but I think we're we're still a, a way off that. It's everyone to come together to try and try and try, try and support that, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, yeah. That's that, that's the difficulty. Now we we've been on for a long, long time, Rick. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna park it there, and we'll potentially get you on again uh, to, to to talk talk through more about your events and, and development because I know you've got loads 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 coming up. Really appreciate your time this morning. If any anyone does want to reach out to you. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously put all your all your details at the end. If anyone wants to join the events and find out how, how, how to get involved in that, same again, uh, either drop your message uh, or, or, or find Graft on, online with the links. Uh, but thank you very much for your time this morning, and um, we will see you again soon. Pleasure. Speak soon.